Thanks, Gleb, for the introduction. And also thanks to all of the organizers for having me at this yeah. nice conference. And thanks for the nice talks today. Um, so I will present some recent giant work with Daniel labadini Fragoso, who's usually in UNAM in Mexico, but visiting Cologne at the moment. So you can find it on the archive. And this is about um, expressing certain Landau Ginsberg potentials on cluster varieties via some projective representations of path algebras of quivers with relations. So I will explain a little bit what kind of functions we want to express in what way. So I will start by some little motivation, especially what is the motivation for me personally. And so this would be Landau Ginsberg potentials on cluster varieties. So I will introduce cluster varieties and then introduce the potentials I will talk about. And then the third section is already about the main result. Okay, so let's start with some motivation. So for me, I'm always in the setup of some, some space I usually denote by A bar, which has some, some weird name, which is a partial compactification of something called a cluster variety. And the cluster variety is just some curly A without the bar. And so you can think of this as some um, space with many toric charts, with many nice toric charts. And for my talk, it is very important that my cluster variety has something which is called some frozen coordinates. And also it should satisfy some technical assumptions, some optimality condition I will explain to you later. Condition. Yeah. And so maybe if you are not familiar with this, this uh, um, looks a little bit weird, but um, this is a very natural space. So I'm very interested in this because for me personally, the main example is the F and cone over partial flag varieties of algebraic groups. And since I'm interested in representation theory of algebraic groups, so this is very, very nice for me that this is a very natural example, but there are many, many examples of those spaces. So maybe we will see some examples in the talk after my talk also. Okay, so in this setup, there is some very nice work of Grasek and K. Konsevich building up on work of Fogontorov. Since this is very lengthy, I will abbreviate the names by GHKK in this talk. And so in this setup, they define some Landau Ginsberg potential. W. Which I will then call the GHKK potential. And this is the function this talk is about. And this is a function on the so-called dual cluster variety. Which I will denote by curly X. And the importance of this function comes from it describing a basis of the ring of regular functions of the partial compactification of my cluster variety I was considering. So in my main example, a basis for the ring of regular functions of um, 
the partial flag variety. Um, so this base, this is described as a subset of the so-called theta bases of the ring of regular functions of the cluster variety. And also this function W gives us for each, so I told you like a cluster variety is a space which comes with many, many toric charts. Um, and this function gives us for each of those toric charts, inequalities of a cone corresponding to a toric degeneration. of our partial compactification of A. And so some examples coming from the world of algebraic groups. So in this way, we get a new interpretation of the geffen sedlin cone. The string cones. And the Littlewood Richardson cone, to name a few examples of uh, cones we obtain by this potential. So, the aim of this project is to get a better understanding of this function W. Or uh, to be a little bit more precise, the potential W is defined recursively and requires some knowledge of certain explicit sequences of mutations, which we might not, not know. Okay, so let me now just throw our result at you and then I will use the rest of my talk to explain what I'm writing now. So as I said, the aim is to express this W in terms of projective representations of path algebras of quivers with relations. And our main result says that if we write W, in a certain Tarek cluster chart, which corresponds to our cluster variety, and part of um, the indexing datum of a cluster chart is also a quiver. So we take the cluster chart corresponding to a fixed quiver Q. then we can express our function as the sum over all frozen vertices of our quiver. And then we take the sum over all possible dimension vectors, which is not the trivial dimension vector. So we don't take the zero representation of the quiver, but we consider all the other representations. And this will give us the exponents of our variables. So we just need to multiply it by minus one. And the coefficients will be given by the Euler characteristic of the corresponding quiver Grassmannians of quotients 
of a projective representation where P of L is the indecomposable projective representation corresponding to our frozen vertex L of our quiver Q of some quotient of the path algebra of Q. Okay, so I will now take some time to explain what those frozen vertices are and what I mean by I express this in the toric chart corresponding to some quiver. And then I will explain to you what uh, quotient of the path algebra I'm considering here. Okay, so let's try to define a little bit better what those cluster varieties are. <laughs> so a cluster variety is a space which is glued from many open tori, or algebraic tori. So each of those tori which are glued, some algebraic tori of the same dimension as our space A. And this might be many, many different tori running over some index set, which is called the set of seats. And so there are several ways to describe a seat. For me, a seat is a pair consisting of a, of a quiver, QS. So this is some quiver, so some oriented finite graph. And the vertices of this quiver, they are divided into two subsets and there will be a subset called mutable vertices and a subset called frozen vertices. And also this quiver shouldn't have any loops or any two cycles. And then a seed is given by a quiver and by a set of Taurus coordinates. On our algebraic Taurus, which belongs to the seed. And then our cluster variety is glued from those Tauri along some birational maps, which are defined um, as some birational maps mapping the torus corresponding to a certain seed to the torus corresponding to another seed. So there's a birational map between those tori, which is called mutation. And there's also a notion of mutation of a quiver, which will give us another quiver. So I can also mutate the quiver corresponding to the seed S, and I will get the quiver corresponding to the seed S prime. So this is some combinatorial rule how to change the quiver.
Okay, let's do a tiny little example to give you some little idea what is going on. So if we take the group as a three over the complex numbers and later we want to take as our partial compactification, the alpha and cone over the flat variety of SL3. Then our cluster variety is some open space inside of it and has two seeds. And the quivers look as follows. We have five vertices and four of them are frozen and only one of them is mutable. So the three here is the only mutable vertex and all other vertices are frozen. And at the mutable vertex, we can mutate and then we get the quiver corresponding to the second seed. And in this case, um, the mutation rule for quivers only says turn all arrows around. And so this other quiver will look like this and still have the same set of frozen vertices and only three, the mutable vertices. And if we mutate again at three, we arrive back at our quiver we started with. And so our cluster variety, since we only have two seeds, is glued from only two tori. Which are certain five-dimensional algebraic tori, which are defined by the non-vanishing of certain minors of matrices. Okay, but now we were not interested really in the cluster variety A, but in its partial compactification. and the Landau-Ginsberg potential corresponding to it. Okay, so what are the frozen vertices of our quiver? They are nothing but the non-vanishing and non-vanishing condition of certain functions defining our cluster variety. So in our example above, um, the cluster variety is defined by the non-vanishing of certain minus of matrices. And if we want to consider its partial compactification, we just allow those functions corresponding to the frozen vertices of our quiver to vanish. So this is the partial compactification and how, what is now this potential? For this, we need not only our cluster variety A, but we also need 
the dual cluster variety. So we have to take the pair of A and the so-called dual cluster variety X. where the dual cluster variety is again a space glued from algebraic tori. And we have the same index set of seeds. And we consider the same quivers as before, but those algebraic tori XS, they have a different set of toric coordinates. And they have a different mutation rule, so a different birational map between them. And in this setup, GHKK, they construct the so called theta basis on the ring of regular functions of our cluster variety A, and also a basis on the ring of regular functions, the partial compactification. And this Landau Ginsburg potential, which is a regular function on the dual cluster variety, which is why we introduced this. So, this is what I call the GHKK potential in this talk, such that for any seed S, our theta basis B is parameterized by the lattice of dimension the vertices of our quiver corresponding to the seed and the basis on the ring of regular functions of the partial compactification is parameterized by the integer points. Little bar. Sorry, was there a question? No, the second beta is beta bar. It's not... uh, beta, ah, uh, there. Thanks. <laughs> okay, yeah, the second basis is um, a subset of the first basis, and this is parameterized by the integer points of a cone defined by the GHKK potential. So this is the cone of all points. Such that when we take our potential and we express it in the toric chart corresponding to our seed, So this is a global function, so we can express it in this toric coordinates. <clears throat> of the algebraic torus corresponding to the seed S. We take this function, we tropicalize it, and we evaluate it at our point X, then this should be greater or equal to zero. And by tropicalization, I just mean every occurrence of multiplication we replace by addition, and every occurrence of addition we replace by the minimum. So the tropicalization of 
the fraction x1 plus x2 divided by x2, for example, is the function mapping the pair x1, x2 to, okay, x1 plus x2, there the plus is replaced by the minimum. So we take the minimum of x1 and x2. And then we have a division, but product is replaced by addition. So <coughs> you get minus x2. Okay, and this is how the cones are defined. The cones coming from the potential are defined, which I talked about in the beginning. Okay, so very important for us is also that we naturally have a summation of this Landau Ginsberg potential it's from its construction. Namely, we have a sum corresponding to each frozen vertex of our quiver. And for this talk, we assume the following optimization assumption. We assume that for our cluster variety, for every frozen vertex L, there exists some feed. such that in the quiver corresponding to the seed, L is a sink. So this we just assume from now on throughout. Okay. So any questions so far? Then we get into our final section and I will explain to you what kind of uh, path algebras and projective representations we use to express this potential. So the algebras we use are the so-called Jacobian algebras defined by Dirksen, Weim, and Selewinski. And for this, I need two definitions. And the first is a potential on a quiver, which should not be confused with the Landau-Ginsberg potential on the cluster variety. So I would call this a dirksen weimann selewinski potential. S, so this is something on a quiver. And this is defined as a linear combination of cycles of the quiver. And the Jacobian algebra, which is the algebra where we take the projective representation from, In the Jacobian algebra, this depends on the quiver and the choice of potential on the quiver, which is why it is denoted by gamma QS. This is the quotient algebra. of the path algebra, or if we want to be precise, the completion of the path algebra with respect to the arrows. But for this talk, it's totally fine if you just think about the path algebra of the quiver. Um, mm. 
Martelou, the so-called Jacobian idea defined by our choice of potential. which is the two-sided idea of our path algebra generated by our cyclic derivatives of our potential with respect to the arrows of our quiver. Okay, I will not precisely define what I mean by cyclic derivatives, but I give you a little example, and then I think from there you can guess the definition. So if we want to consider Jacobian algebras, it's uh, we should take an example of a quiver which actually has some cycle. Otherwise, we just get the usual path algebra of our quiver as Jacobian algebra. So let's take this quiver here, which has three vertices and one cycle. And so the potential, a potential on this quiver is the linear combination of cycles. So let us just take the one cycle we have. We first work. C and then A and then B. Uh, other way around, sorry. C, A, B. And then we have to take the cyclic derivatives with respect to each error, which is like the partial derivative with respect to the errors in such a way that it makes sense. So if we take the partial derivative with respect to A, we get the path just first work B and then work C. If we take the cyclic derivative with respect to B, we get the path first work C and then A. And if we get, if we take the cyclic derivative with respect to C, we first work A and then B. So in our Jacobian idea, are all paths of length two. So this means in our Jacobian algebra, we have this relation. So all paths of length two vanish. Okay, so let me write the theorem again, which I had at the beginning and stated now more precisely. So this is the result together with Labadini Fragoso. So we fix any seed as and Q, the quiver of the seed. And we fix some rows and vertex of the quiver. And then we want to express the sum of the Landau-Ginsburg potential corresponding to this frozen vertex. And for this, we take Q upper L to be the full subquiver. of our quiver Q, where we remove all frozen vertices, which are not L. Mm -hmm. And then we choose some potential on this quiver. And we have to make this choice a little bit nice. We cannot make it completely arbitrary. We have to choose the so-called non-degenerate potential. So I did not define what this is, but if we take a quiver, which comes from a cluster variety, we can always choose a non-degenerate potential.
And after we've chosen that, the first part of the result says that the indecomposable projective representation of this Jacobian algebra which corresponds to the vertex L of our cover QL is always finite dimensional. Of course, in general, the Jacobian algebra might be infinite dimensional, but this projective is always finite dimensional. And if we take this Landau Ginsburg potential and we take the salmon corresponding to our frozen vertex L and we express it in the toric chart corresponding to uh, our seed S, our fixed seed S, we fixed at the beginning, then this is the sum over all dimension vectors of our quiver, which is not the trivial one. Then we take the Euler characteristic of the quiver Grassmannian of quotients of our projective representation. And as exponents, we just take the negative of the uh, of the dimension vector. So, and yeah, let me just define the curva Grassmannian. The curva Grassmannian of quotients. This is just <coughs> the set of all representations n such that the dimension vector of n is our chosen e and n is a quotient <laughs> of our n. Okay, there was a question, I think. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I wanted to give an example, but maybe this is a very nice point to stop and get us a little bit more back to the schedule. Yeah. So if there are any questions, you can shoot now. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. Questions? How we prove it? Ah, so uh, to prove it, it's actually a two-step proof. So, um, so the main part is to to see that this projective representation this behaves nice under mutation. So there's a, a certain notion of mutations of representations of Jacobian algebras. And then one has to see that this projective actually mutates to the projective. So this is the first step of proving it. But then one needs to realize that this, what I wrote here, is something which is called a dual F polynomial, but without constant term. So the next step is to prove that also the F polynomial of the projective mutates well under the kind of mutation we want to apply here. And then one has to, to do a little bit of Dirksen Weimann Silevinsky yoga to, to see that. Yeah, but I guess the heart um, of the proof is to see that the projective representation behaves well under mutation. And so I have a question. So, with uh, Kanikuba and Nakashima, we have an uh, algorithm for computing uh, there's a coefficient for a classical group. And that's a curse that they are all of powers of two. So do you, uh, from your theory, is it possible to see that all these Euler characteristics are powers of two? I hope so, but I don't idea. know. <laughs> I, I really hope so, yeah, uh, but uh, I have yeah. no idea at the moment. So it just was possible to, for classical groups, it's always power of two. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but uh, I hope that there's some interpretation. Mm -hmm. 
uh, there is a formula by Goncher and Chen for, for the same potential. I think it's, it gives the same thing for. for it's a bunch of enchant potential, right? I think it's not it's not exactly the same. I don't think it's uh, actually a Taurus isomorphism, but it's almost. Uh, I think there's some. Um, I'm not quite sure what the map between those potential has. Because it also gives the, the partial correct partial compactification. So yeah, but it's different. But for certain, those black and white graphs, it's kind of different. There's no representation of anything here. It's a slightly different potential, I think, but it's yeah, almost yeah, but the same. Of course, to apply to uh, G G or B, yeah. yeah, of course, the chart of change is also only for G or B. It should be a pullback, I think, of this of this potential. So it's, there should be some pullback map, and then you can, yeah, you can apply this construction and then a pullback map. This should give, but I have to check. So yes, it should be apl uh, applicable, this formula, to Gonshar of Shen. So I have a question. What confuses me is, uh, you said the Jacobian algebra depends on the potential. Um, but um, the F polynomial, uh, so the dimension vector is the same, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's magic, but this is already Dirksen Wilman Selavinsky magic. So, uh, yeah. but is it? But but like, is there what's? I mean, is there a good example where you can like nicely see how the Jacobian algebra differ? Uh, yeah, you can take the Markov quiver for example. So this is a very nice example. Are they both non-degenerate and? Yeah, there are uh, infinitely many non-degenerate uh, potentials. But one is maybe finite dimensional, the other is infinite dimensional, or is it too finite dimensional? Uh, there are infinite dimensional, finite, uh, infinitely many finite dimensional, and also an infinite oh, dimension. So see. there are like infinitely many examples for the Markov quiver, and for all of those examples, you get the same dimension vector of the projective. Of course, that's what the theorem says. Yes, it's funny. Um, but yes, you can check. But for double Bruhat cells, like when you consider the variety, <laughs> there's only one unique non-degenerate potential. So there's not really much. I see, clear. I see. But but if you have the F polynomial, not just the dimension vector, then somehow this determines the representation, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I don't know. I would guess so. But so I'm then not that sure. means then I'm that means sure. um, there is a class of potentials which give you the right F polynomial mm -hmm. somehow, or I mean, no, not like if, for example, if I do principal extension of the class out of like- The F polynomial is independent of the potential as long as it's non-degenerate. Exactly, so. but um, but if the F polynomial gives representations, and if I look at the principal extension of a mutable quiver, then the, the projective representations of this principal extension probably determines the Jacobian algebra? Oh, you have to be careful with that because the uh, Jacobian algebra is not so well behaved with frozen with frozen vertices. Mm. I'm not sure about the principal extension. That's why we are doing this, this actually little thing that we erase all frozens except for the one we are looking at right now. So there's like there's a way of fixing it. I think some technical way. I'm not sure. Maybe it's Matthew Presland or I don't know. There's some paper how to fix it, but then I'm I'm not <coughs> sure. It's not so well behaved with frozen. So okay, thank you. Okay, so thanks there again. Nice. Thank you. Thank you.